your presence. Uh, it's your focus point of today's message. It's called coming out of your prisons. Uh, I'm going to be coming from the book of Colossians, the second chapter, 14 verse. And man, just want to thank you for uh, your prayers this week. Those of you who have been praying, definitely want to uh, let you know that I appreciate your effort and ask that you continue to keep us lifted up in prayer. Amen. Uh, Colossians, the second chapter, verse number 14 is where I'm going to pick up, uh, once again, coming out of your prisons. Uh, what is a prison? A prison is the place of bondage. It is the place of your bondage. And we, as individuals, might have different areas in our lives where we are in bondage, where we are in um, positions or uh, circumstances where we feel like we cannot win, where we feel like we don't have any liberty or freedom. And so that is a bondage, that is a prison in your life. And we all have individual areas where we are struggling, where we are uh, overwhelmed, where we are we're going through. And so uh, we want to deal with that issue today because Jesus has made provisions for each and every one of us to come out of our prisons. Your prison does not have any authority to hold you. Your prison, doesn't matter what it is, it's important for you to understand that it doesn't have the authority to hold you, that you can get out, that you can get free if you want to be free. Matter of fact, the word declares that he has already made you free. And so it is uh, very uh, uh, important that you understand that whatever your struggle, whatever your bondage, whatever your uh, holding place is, does not have uh, the ability to keep you there. You can walk out of that prison. Now, when we go to um, Colossians, the second chapter, the 14th verse says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So we have Paul here telling the Colossian church saying, Christ has blotted out, the word blotted out means to wipe out, to wipe away the handwriting of ordinances that were against you. Now, the Bible says that there was a handwritten ordinances or ordinance represent law or rules or regulations that were written by hand that were against me. It was against me. It was contrary to me. It opposed me. It hindered me. It stopped me. Uh, uh, the Bible says that it was a handwritten ordinance. Uh, when you go back to the Old Testament and read the story of, of Moses, you find that Moses had received a, a tablet that was written. The Bible says that God took his hand and wrote on the stone the laws that he wanted man to uphold and to live by. And so when the Bible says that it was a handwritten orders, it was laws that had been written by God that man was supposed to obey and follow. But man failed in their attempt to obey and follow the laws that God had written out by his hand. And so the Bible says that because man had failed to obey the handwritten ordinances, that those laws were now against us. The Bible says that those laws now opposed us. They were set against us to stop us because we had disobeyed those laws. Now I want you to get in mind, get in this, uh, this understanding that we had uh, required, we had built of a debt that we could not pay. I want you to think about going somewhere and, and using somebody's stuff or, or, or taking something and then coming out and not being able to pay what you owe. And so here it is, a, 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 a receipt or a bill that's been written out to your name where you owe someone, where you are in debt to someone and you cannot pay the person that you owe. And since you cannot pay them, the Bible says that the 
enemy is going to uh, come against you. Matter of fact, let's go to uh, let's go to the book of Corinthians, First Corinthians. Let's go to First Corinthians, the fifteenth chapter. We'll come back to Colossians, but I want to I want to show this to you because it's very important that you understand this. First Corinthians, the fifteenth chapter. Go to verse number fifty-five. What I'm going to show you now is how this bill, this, this, this uh, written bill that has my name on it gave Satan sickness, disease, poverty, depression, the right to trouble my life because I had a bill that I wasn't paying. And the bill said that because of what I owe, he had the right to attack me. He had the right to persecute me. He had the right to send sickness in my life to send disease in my life, to even ultimately send me to hell because I had built up a bill in sin that I could not pay. And the only thing I had to give was my life to settle my debt, which meant that I would be lost forever. And so Jesus had to come to settle the debt that I owed. Now, in Colossians, first, excuse me, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, 51st verse, the Bible says, you have that read up for me. Yeah, 55. O devil, where is thy sin? Uh -huh. O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Okay, start right there. Death, where is your sting? He says, what of the, um, the 56th verse? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The sting of death. What is death? Death is not just to be dead in the grave, but death also represents sickness and disease and poverty and depression and heartache and all of the things that trouble our life. He says the sting of death is sin. In other words, what is the sting? The sting, the sting of it is the thing that gives it power. The thing that gives it an ability to hurt me, the, 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 a, a bee or a wasp or, or, or a scorpion, the thing that gives it power is its stinger. That's the way it fights. That's the way it kills you. The bee can't kill you. The wasp can't hurt you without the stinger. The stinger is what gives it the power to hurt you, to put poison in you. So the Bible says that the sting of death is sin. What gives death the right to attack me is my sin. What gives sickness and disease the right to come against me is my sin. What gives depression the right to come against me is my sin. So he says that the sting of death is sin, or the power of sin, or the power of death is sin. What does the second part say? And the strength of sin is the law. And the strength of sin it's the law. Because the law, the broken law, the, the, the broken of uh, the written uh, 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 bill is what gives sin strength. What gives it strength? What gives sin strength is the law. In other words, listen to this. If there is no law, then I can't be in sin. Sin is the breaking of the law. That's what sin is. Sin is the breaking of God's law. If there is no law, then there can be no sin. And if there is no sin, then I cannot be a sinner. I cannot be a sinner if there is no law. I cannot be a sinner if there is no rules or regulations that I've broken. And if I am not a sinner, then Satan has no power against me. 
Amen. The thing that gives Satan power against the world is that we are all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And since we are all born in sin and shaped in iniquity, he has the right to persecute us and to hurt us and to harm us and to drive us to our grave. But when sin is taken away, then it takes away his power to hurt us. So now anything he brings against me, it is unlawful. Because I am not in sin. How can you say you're not in sin? I am not in sin because I am in Christ. Christ delivers me from my sins. Christ delivers me from my transgression. Christ delivers me from the broken law. And so if I am not in the position of broken law, then you can't persecute me as a lawbreaker. Amen. Okay. Now let's go back to um, um, Colossians. The 15th verse says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, having spoiled, what does it mean to spoil? To spoil means to defeat. Amen. But not only to defeat, but to strip him of his authority. To strip him of his ability. To strip him of his power. In other words, the Bible says that when Jesus was on the cross, that one of the things that he did on the cross was he stripped Satan of his ability to harm the believer. He stripped Satan of his ability to attack the believer and rob the believer of the life that Jesus came to give them. And so because of the cross of Christ, Satan has lost his right to attack me and my family. But not only that, but he has spoiled him. Spoiled means that he takes his authority and he takes his property. He takes everything that he had and he gives it to those who were defeated. He takes the peace. This is what the Bible says that when he rose from the grave, he rose up with the keys. Talking about Jesus. When Jesus rose up from the grave, he came up with the keys of the kingdom. He had the keys of hell, death, and the grave. That Satan no longer had the keys. The keys represent the authority. Satan had the authority. He had the keys of hell, death, and the grave. When Jesus rose up from the death and from the grave, he rose up with the keys. In other words, he had stripped Satan of his authority. He had stripped him of his power of the grave and of death and of hell. And so the one who used to be in control had been stripped of his power, he's no longer in control anymore. Amen. Amen. He no longer has authority anymore. It's important for you as a believer to understand this so that you don't allow him to do in your life what he does not have the right to do. So that you don't allow him to do what he's trying to do because he don't have the right to do that to you. He has the right to do it to the world, but not to you because you are covered by the blood. And so there is a difference between a believer living in a paradise world and a non-believer living in a paradise world because the believer is covered by the blood. Thank you, Lord. And so as long as I am covered by the blood, what happens over here don't supposed to happen to me. Sickness over here, but not here. Disease over here, but not here. Poverty over here, but not here. Why? Because I am covered by the blood. Okay. He says to us that Corey, because you are in Christ, your debt for your sins has been paid. You don't owe me anything anymore. You are free of guilt. Everything that you did, I have paid for that. I have paid the price for that. So you don't owe anybody. Your debt is settled. But not only that, but you are no longer even under the law anymore. The law is not for the righteous. The law is for the unrighteous. Because the righteous have in their heart the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit teaches us how we ought to live. And so I don't do things not because of the law, but because of the Holy Spirit, who is the umpire of my heart, who leads and guides me in all truth. Amen. And so I don't do it not because of the law, but I don't do it because the Spirit of God is living inside of me, and he teaches me how to live. He governs my life, and he shows me how 
because you, 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 you're not going to break the law because the Spirit teaches you what to do. You're not going to cuss nobody out because the Spirit ain't going to let you cuss them out. You're not going to rob nobody because the Spirit is not going to let you rob nobody. You're not going to steal this and do that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit inside of you is going to lead you away from that. And so I don't have to put a law over you because there is something inside of you called the Holy Spirit that conducts the way you live, that conducts the way you think, that conducts the places you go, that conducts the friendships that you have. And because the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, you don't need no law. Amen. Now the world needs a law because they don't have the spirit. And so because of their lawless condition, you have to give them a law. Mm -hmm. You have to tell them that if you do such and such, I'm going to put you in jail. Mm -hmm. You have to tell them that if you do this and do that, you're going to go to jail. Because they don't have inside of them a Holy Spirit that stops them from going too far. <coughs> this is why the Bible says don't be unequally yoked. Because of, uh, of someone who is saved has the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them and the Spirit governs the way they live. Well, if that person marries somebody who's not saved, that person don't have the Spirit in them. And so that person don't have anybody governing the way that they live. They don't have anybody governing the things that they say and do. And so that person will cuss you out. Amen. That person will mistreat you. That will step and walk on your feelings and not even say I'm sorry. Why? Because they don't have the spirit inside of them to tell them they went too far. Amen. See, the spirit of God in me is what governs me. Not my wife. My wife don't govern me. The spirit governs me. And so my wife benefits from the work that the Spirit is doing in my heart. You understand what I'm saying? The spirit, if the Spirit was not working inside of me, there is nothing she could do to control me. Amen. If you watch somebody every day, you still couldn't control them if they want to do something. Amen. You couldn't control them. If it's in them to do, they're going to do it. Amen. If it's in them, they will find a way to do. I don't care how much you try to watch them or, 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 or set up different things to catch them, this and catch. If it's in them to do, they will find a way to do it. People go to jail and locked up in prison and still get drunk, still get high, still have sex, still do everything they was doing in the world. They do it right there in prison. How in the world can you do all of that in prison? Because where there's a will, there's a way. If it's in them to do it, they will find a way. They sit around and think of ways how to do this and do that. Because if it's in them, they're going to do it. This is why the Bible says be careful who you connect with. Because if that person don't have the Holy Spirit on the inside of them, then they don't have nothing covering the way they treat you. Amen. But a husband who is full of the Holy Spirit, if he does not respond to his wife properly, even if he won't hear the wife, he'll hear the Spirit. Because the Spirit will reprove him of his words and of his deeds and cause him to humble himself. Even when she can't get through, the Holy Ghost will get through. Amen. Ain't no whooping like a Holy Ghost whooping. He will bring you to a place, a place of humility where you will repent of your actions. Okay. This is what God says. He says, listen, and this is very important for the body of Christ to understand. There is no penalty over your life. You're free. You're free. You don't understand it, you don't believe it, but you're free. There is no condemnation. There's no condemnation. There is no guilt. There is no condemnation. There is no um, um, uh, uh, 